And yes, we are doing part two of the listening interview session with Nick Bollinger, the one and only, yeah. Big ups, Himihi Nui Ki, Kwe Taku Manu Hiri. Yeah, special guest. Great Thank, to be back. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, I listened to the program, you know, as, yeah, you should. And I was thinking, yeah, part two. <laughs> well, here we are. We need to finish it. Yeah. So, hmm. Yeah, a few songs we didn't get through last time. Yeah, four songs, but then, yeah, there's all of the dubs, there's aside a- from Waiting Dub and the Instrumentals, which are just a nod, as we just see, I was saying off here just before, I was saying to Nick that instrumentals isn't a matter of just taking out the vocal and thus uh, instrumental is there. No, you need to sort of give it a, a little re-jig, can move things into the centre there where the vocal was taking up the space. So, yeah. It'd be good to listen to one of those a bit later on. For sure, for sure. But should we start with the first one that we l- somehow missed out last time? Because yes. it's an important track. Count, counter-attack. Counter-attack. And I will say about this, this is just three chords, and it's a very basic song, you know. You know, G-sharp, A-sharp, D-sharp. You know, just those chords, again. major chords, and it's just coming in. And I, I just had that in my head. Like, I think a lot of people have those three chords in their heads anyway, or those types of chords. And But I wanted to make something of it. So, man, I'm going to make it, use this as, a, as the basis for a Scar song, but just adding everything I added to it in the trombone, you know. Yeah. I wanted a trombone solo, and I, I just says to Chris Fox, just, you know, Go for it there. <laughs> and you and, nailed it. And you've got your scar drummer on this track. Yeah, yeah. Ruben. Ruben. And yeah, and you're playing about ten instruments. <laughs> well, the the piano. I was pleased to get that piano in. And I'm just banging away at the thing in certain places. Like there's this whole sort of I wanted it to be like a jamboree, New Orleans street band yeah. type, just joyous noise. And I you know, mixing it, I'm not sure. I just kind of uh, needs to be. Uh, maybe I didn't quite get there. As well, well, I, I need to hear it on the vinyl. Re- really, that's where I'll end up hearing it better. When are we going to hear the vinyl? Well, I did bother Holiday <laughs> Records, who are making the vinyl, and I spoke with the brother yesterday. He says, "Well, we should have it in about two weeks, start of June, and then they'll send it to me, test pressing, and then we'll check it there, and then get back to them, and then it rolls around fast." After we've they've got received the test pressing, unless there's some disastrous thing where it needs to go back to Europe or wherever, and yeah, so so if you like the test pressing, you just say, yep, yeah, roll and, the presses. And there are other things as well, you know, that you know for our last album, I got it back and and I I I spoke with Mike Gibson about the whole thing with vinyl, and he says, well, you know, there's there's grades of vinyl that they may use for the pressing and you want to get the best grade of vinyl for the pressing, not the B grade. <laughs> you know, and is that the, the weight of the vinyl or is it more than just that? Yeah, no, no, it's more than that. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's not just that. There's some, there's other technical things which I'm not really listening for 
I'm just listening to the bass and treble and oh yeah, right. But there's other aspects to it which is uh, yeah, best up left up to <laughs> hard out sound engineers like Mike, of course. Yeah. Well, should, you, should we have a listen to Counter Attack? I think we've set people up to hear this. And anything else you want to say about it before we hear it? Ah, let's do it. Liberty Aluta Kantanua Mana Moto Hake Freedom Ala Mitakue Oyasin Tumunika Derecho Sumano Sagu Intifada I know what you mean about the New Orleans street party vibe there. It's like a, yeah, a kind of righteous party, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's that was the the plan was to bring that that vibes to a yeah. 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 I do want to mention about this is the chorus that it has nine languages in there: Liberté, French, Aluta Continua, Portuguese, Mana Motuhake, Maori, Freedom, English, Aman La. From Africa, Mitakue uh, Oyasin, that's Lakota, our native brothers and sisters over there in the north of America, Tumuninka, which is Tagalog, Philippines, Derechos Humanos, that's human rights, and that is Spanish, and Struggle, English again, and Intifada, which is Arabic. Yeah. yeah, and so I was pleased to be able to bring, bring together these languages, nine of them, in a song here, from my travels, you know, as well. Yeah, and that stuff that you cover in the book that's coming <laughs> yes. on its way. Yes, yes, the book, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Anyway, we'll do another interview when that comes out. But look, um, well, let's cover these other songs that we, that we didn't do. Um, Counterattack, Warmonger is another one. Warmonger, yes, well, we uh, didn't do, which is a reggae song. And Warmongers is from 2005, released on Legacy, the album Legacy. And yeah, through the years, because that's 17 years ago, I've wanted to. I think, man, we need to remake this song. So, well, I've, I've redone the lyrics. 
rewritten the lyrics. I just felt like I needed to update the lyrics. Well, yeah. I don't know if it was an update. Just, just what I just wanted to say other things more in line with my vibe at the moment. Although the other lyrics, of course, stand true. It feels like a song that you might have been listening to even before the first Upper Hutt Posse record, you know, even before you were listening to hip-hop. Is that right? Were you listening to, you know, Conscious Reggae? Oh, yeah. Conscious Reggae, was it? That that love of, you know, of course Bob Marley. But, you know, the first reggae I heard was like, yeah, Bob Marley and Third World, Jimmy Cliff. Yeah. You know, the, we had The Harder They Come. Yeah. And then The Rockers. So, you know, big on those. There's two soundtracks. Yeah. 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 But then... Moved on, well, and no, I never move on from the end. That's still here, right? Rock solid, but moved into dub, Prince Farai, Scientist, in particular, got those albums, and then hearing the More Wells and the Gladiators, yeah, the Mighty Diamonds, and hearing the full albums of artists that are on the Rockers soundtrack, yes, and hearing all that reggae music, yeah, yeah, that's. Well, this track reminded me of that era of, of reggae. Well, that's great because it's, it's such an influence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Undeniable. And, and there's a wild saxophone solo on this one too. Who, who did that? Ah, that, that's Jeff Henderson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I wanted to do something because I felt when we played this song live, I was saying, like, you know, we're just going to have that boom, 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 boom going through the verses. And the first version doesn't have that but yeah when you went to play it live it just lent itself to that so it's like right this is going to be in the chorus now and it's going to be more scar than the original yeah yeah which gets me to thinking now i need to play it i'll play the original and then we'll go to how it is now Programmed in the software program Reason with a bit of electric guitar on there from Tihikuda Hohaya on that album back in 2005 release. Yeah, so well, let's hear what you've done with it this time. Yeah.
Warmonger. Yes. New, new version. And, yeah, we were just saying, you've tightened up the, uh, the format of the song. The choruses are shorter and sort of punchier now, aren't they? Yeah, I've done that with all of the songs, in fact. And it's really to do with vinyl. I made this record to be on vinyl. And the maximum length anyone wants to put on vinyl records is 24 minutes. So I'm like, okay, well, I've got to get six and seven songs on 24 minutes. So, man, and... <laughs> you need some I, editing. <laughs> yeah, no, but I've felt the, all the goodness is squeezed and it's just made, uh, oh, it feels so much better to me. And I'm thinking, man, I don't need to do these choruses twice over. I've just felt like this is a good length for a chorus, so I'll do it. Yeah. Now I'm like, no, it needs to be shorter. And I had had some ed- editing back in, like, decades ago. Someone had said, you know, oh, maybe you could edit it edit some things in the song i'm like no no that's how it's done it, yeah this is the art it's done but i'm thinking you get too precious with it but and i have like moving in demand it's not on vinyl but it's going to be soon and i've edited that edited the hell out of that to get it fit on vinyl wow and it sounds <laughs> sounds great so you know, it doesn't feel like you're missing something no i don't no, it just it tightens it up yeah in some ways it it's treating treating the songs like uh like old seven-inch singles, you know, you've only got, a, yeah, you know, so a short pack time. Pack it all in, yeah, pack, pack it all in, make it punch. Actually, it was Benny Staples who said to me after on listening to Moving and Demand, he goes, oh, maybe you could put a few edits here and there. Yeah. But I just wasn't ready for it. You know? <laughs> so it's taken you 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Declaration of Resistance, I did it within. I was like, no, I'm going to watch the lengths of these courses. Yeah. And I, I listened to... A lot of older songs so they have a longer chorus, isn't that? Mm. It, it seems as though now, with all of the new music that's coming out from all of the young cats that have been to music school and everything, you know, you, now you've got two and a half minute songs. Mm. There's two minute songs and three minute songs. And, you know, they've been told this is the, the length <laughs> of the song. They've been taught in that way. Whereas, you know, no one was telling us the length of the song. Then on the other hand, you've got Fat Freddy's Drop that are doing, you know, yeah. They've always been sticking with over six minute lengths, you know, seven, eight sure. minute songs. And but when I was listening I went to a gig of theirs and I was thinking, mm, I need to hear the next song now <laughs> you know. <laughs> Cause I always felt like they man, they're long winded on it. And, you know, that's just me looking at it as uh not not being critical of the music, but looking at the length of the song and thinking yeah. Bang! You need to come in now with a ragamuffin toasting. Well, <laughs> yeah, one thing about this this new album, it's uh, you don't have time to get bored. You know, it's you've got so many tracks, and each one's different. Yeah, and I mean, in fact, in fact, there's a huge range. I mean, as we were talking about a fortnight ago, there's everything from from ska to free jazz, you know, and yep. everything in between. But uh, what are we going to hear next? Let's. There's another. It's just kind of a. Well, I think of it as a sort of dance hall feel. Um, Skin na color we. Ah uh, yes, this song is also from the Legacy album, and I'll play uh, some of the original here. And yes, it's dance hall definitely. Let me just pull the track up. So we're going to hear a bit of the original version, and then we'll hear what you've done with it this time around. Yes, a- another one. The, this song here, I just felt like, man, you know, we'd, we'd do it live, skin na color we. And it's talking about our emotions are not colored by the skin that another person is in. So skin doesn't color our emotions. And yeah. so, yeah, we're not racist, man. So it's a hard out anti racist song, actually. You know, I was in Jamaica when I wrote this song. In 2002, or was it 2001? Well, it certainly I've feels twice. Feels like it might have come out of Jamaica. Actually, yeah. it's a, it was 2002. I was there, and you were hearing a lot of dance hall. Oh, you? It yeah. was in the air. Yeah, for sure, love it. But I'd be listening to dance hall here in the sure. And but I was there, and I was just looking at a whole lot of black people going into Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I was just thinking. Why are they going into this goddamn Kentucky Fried Chicken when they've got the jerk chicken selling on the street yeah. and it's the best chicken I've 
eight in my life. <laughs> and they're going to this American franchise uh, yeah. instead. Yeah, it's like, man, oh, well. the mighty advertiser. <laughs> <laughs> and, but then you look at, you know, where's it from? Kentucky? God <laughs> damn. <laughs> uh, you know, rednecks and, and all that. Everything. And, yeah. and the, the colonel. And I just, it came to my mind, just the whole, the whole thing. And, uh, of course, I had that in my head, you know, the, the, the rhythm there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, let's hear these two versions. We'll hear yeah. a little bit of the old one anyway. Skin. Just saying to you, Nick, that's Emma Pucky playing that. that little keyboard. Yeah, uh, it's a keyboard sound. Yeah. And that. Ding, ding. <laughs> and Emma didn't really play instruments on any other posse song, but she did on this one. Well, I pulled her in to do some vocals on another track, I think, and I was playing this one. She goes, oh, I got something for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so me, I know she can play music, of course. Yeah. But. It's an unusual part. She's probably the only person who could come up with it. Yeah, she put it in. I was like, well, yeah, that's sweet. Because, yeah. you know, other other things like working with, with someone like Emma, I pulled her, her in for Waiting, which we played last week, whenever yes. the show was actually. And I says, right, I've got these vocals, you know, to go in the, in the, in the chorus, sort of the ooh, ah, do, 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 the yeah. thing, you know. I says, yeah, yeah. And she goes, no, no, she, yeah. Then she went in. She goes, yeah, yeah, just put it on. And then and I played it back to her, and bang, something else came out. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, that's magic. Because I yeah. never would have come up with what she came up with. And what she came up with was a whole lot better than what I came up with as a backing vocal. Yeah. She, she's such a creative musician, you know. Her music's not like anyone else's. Yeah. I'd yeah. love to hear more of it. You know, there, there hasn't been any for a long time. Yeah. I think it's just a matter of her, you know. Linking up with yeah. the right, sorting out the right situation and yeah. getting it down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's great to hear this. Should we hear the, the new version? The yeah. one you've done? Do Anything else you want to tell us about it? Ah, just a big song. Skin out. A, lot, a lot of people liked it when it came out, too. I think just the vibe of it. Respect no woman. 
moments, girl, I should relay the glad to right and justice a summer we expect. No problem, no sweat and threat. We are step yet of justice, them say it is a colorless thing. Why a man might be for that is suffering thing. Yet if justice, them say it is a certain thing. Why a man might be for not justice, we are saying if truth them say it is a colorless thing. When will it shine upon the injustice? If truth them say it is a certain thing. Why is there no truth in this legality? The brain has a south of man, but in the not in green. No skin color can account even green. Judge them in a chick we find we can see. Each one man come and greet so my No man's color should delay respect. No woman's color should relay neglect. Oh. System, them say the truth, it must ring. Get them racist policemen, them bound to bring. No justice, no peace, we know certain thing. No justice, no peace, yes, my people keep us saying. Cause truth, them and it's not from colorless things. It's shine for attaining knowledge. Of the truth, there's so many a certain thing. Knowledge that come with legal force of the brain. I'll suss out them system, Pantina, and Cree. Them system, justice, cause nothing men can see. Justice, not judicious, them power, them fee. Them system for them, so we need to. We bleed. No man's color should bring man regret. A woman's color from it now forget. Whoa. In na color we UHP in the area. Yes, right. With doing part two of the listening session for the album Ho with Nick Bollinger right here. Te reo te upoko te ka. Yeah, it's great to be here, and I'm finding out about the tracks that we didn't get through two weeks ago when we spent two hours listening to the album. Yeah, yeah. But we did a lot of talking, <laughs> but. There's one more vocal track that we were going to play. Um, Patua te pa whera. Patua te pa whera. Yeah. Pa, pa whera is rape. It's the act of raping. <clears throat> so yeah. when you say... This is your angriest song in a way. <laughs> Kia so. And would you say uh, patua is to hit, to strike, also yeah. to kill. So when I'm saying patua mm. te pa whera, uh, literally... Kill, rape. But within the song, I say, mm. Patua the kai pa fira. So kai pa fira is the rapist. So I'm saying, kill the rapist, also in this song. Mm. And this, <laughs> you know, I thought about it for a while and thought, man, do I want to be saying to kill anybody or anything in that such a direct way? And I think, well, yeah, this is how I feel. God damn. And this song is from 91. And Oh, I'm going to play the original version again here. It's called String Em Up. And <laughs> String Em Up. Like, let's string up the rapist. And so, yeah. But So you've heard really, this song for 30 years now. Yeah, yeah I was yeah. listening to Minister Lewis Farrakhan speaking in his, in his speech, Respect for Woman. And... And he's talking, and these quotes are saying, man, that's, uh, I, I want to use that in the song. But that actually set the whole song off. And I've always wanted to, well, no, actually, no, I haven't always wanted to 
write a song <laughs> about rape. It's a curious one. I haven't thought about it, but I wanted to make some comment about it. And, well, that's how I make comment, through songs. And uh, so I did this version back in around 91, maybe 92. And, yeah, called it String Em Up. And it's just, yeah, been on the back burner until now. But uh, I've always loved the music, and it's changed somewhat, of course. This was all programmed yeah. on, I would say that, in Sonic EPS 16+. plus. Yeah. So we're gonna. Have you got that version? Yes. So we can hear a bit of how it started out. Yeah, I'm gonna pull back, pull down the fader in some places because it's not G-rated. And yeah, here we go. This is called "String 'Em Up," which has become "Patuwa Te Pa Fera." The world is headed into hell because the world disrespects. Womanhood. Yeah, it starts with that original one, but I just pulled it down a little bit here because there's a glitch, and we just sort of. You kill over your woman, brother. You don't let a damn soul infect and destroy your woman. Yeah, just pull it down for a second. <laughs> Nick, have you heard of a, a song that's calling for a rapist to be killed? That's the only one I can think of. Yeah, I have been thinking of it for quite some years now. If so there's a song, that's thirty years. That's thirty-one years ago. That version. Yeah, yeah. But just now, when I'm going to bring it out as part of the perfect, I'm singing. Do I know? Is there a song that specifically is saying, you know, kill the rapist? And but in this instance, kill rape. Hmm. I'm thinking no. But it's such a goddamn thing that happens everywhere, every day. Mm. But it's not a topic for songwriters. So I'm glad that I've, you know, man, smashed in that wall. You've said it. And doing it, yeah. Yeah. But maybe there's a, a punk rock song. They're yeah. the only folks that I could think that would do it, you know, would be hard oh, oh. out. Like, an all-woman punk band might have done it, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. But, but I haven't heard it. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but are... but we'll, it's a subject for further investigation. I think we need to have a look and see if there's any others. Yeah, and it I wouldn't a... be a bad thing if this song had a partner out there somewhere, you know. Yeah. And surely you know some, some punk rock people around town and they might say, hey, oh, well, there is a song. <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll, we'll put the call out there, you know, let us know. Let yeah. us know. Right. Well, so, <laughs> what's he saying? So, shall we hear the version that's on the new album? Yeah, Patuwa Te Pa Fera. Coming. Yeah. Hey, why 
Nato Mofaka Wiri Wiri King Awa Hine Yo, the rapist take him out Kai Pafu Ain't no place anyway, anytime for him But the way the Pafu Go fuck up at the Apikino Hey, Pati Ki, the head of the Malesta In La Cabeza Oh, Koko Hua Hua ya takai ora ora tenai Ki te kai Pafu Ko tana he Hey, mea wedi wedi king a iwi Me whaka tika Hey, mea, ko rewa rewa Hey, whaka moho Me whaka puta te uju Crack what you do A long, long time This shit's been going on A long, long time Too long But do what the bar fed Ain't no place anyway in time for it I'll fuck them up there at the gate bar fed That's the kind of spirit That's the kind of spirit Icicle slither Traumatic whirlpool frenzy Spirit shredded fragments Degradation, disintegration, trust, shame, guilt, unworthiness, abandonment, rejection, tears of a chiseled burn, hurt, and finally, death. Well, you wouldn't do that for a prostitute. I don't care what she is. She's not that because she's that. She's that because she met a no good man that turned out. Stop it. Kill rape. It's just got to go. And that last, that last verse. You've got Blue Dread in there too. Yes, Blue Dread. From, it goes right back to the earliest days of the posse. Yeah, for those listeners out there that don't know, you know, we formed UHP, Up Art Posse, as a four-piece reggae band around 19, in 1985. That was me on keyboards and vocals, Blue Dread. On guitar and vocals, my brother MCY on bass, vocals, and Daryl Thompson, not then known as DLT, on drums. That's the that's the original founding four piece lineup of UHP. Because for some reason people are saying that Teddy Moana is a founding member, as is MC Beware. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think they don't go saying they are. I've said to, I said to them, hey, you're not. And they're like, yeah. Uh, yeah. But people will see that. A journalist will see that in one story that she's been mentioned as a founding member of and UHP. they'll repeat it. And yeah. yeah, it's repeated. And it's like, oh, it doesn't matter what she says. Yeah. She's a <laughs> you could, yeah. But I'm like, well, I don't care what the journalists and the newspapers say. The fact is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Blue Dreads, 
No, I'll just I'll speak on Blue Jet for a moment, man, because we formed a reggae band. When we started pulling in rap music more, that's when MCB Weir came in and then Te Moana. You know, he was like, well, you fellas can go and do that hippity ploppity stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. He's got his names. He's called it something like that. And, says, <laughs> and, you know, when you do something, when you want to do some serious roots jamming, well, you know, you know, I'm here. And so, yeah, he's, he just loves the roots reggae. And you brought him in for that one. Yeah, brought him in for that. Although he he did toasting on No Worries in the Party Tonight on our first single. Yeah. But he's not on the first album or the second. I think he got back in the third one, Ma Te Wa. Yeah. Yeah. And then he wasn't on Tohe, our seventh album. No. But he's Declaration of Resistance was our seventh album. He No, he was on that. He wasn't on the one before that, Tohe. Right. Then he came back and doing just doing some vocals on Declaration of Resistance and also on this one, vocals, but also percussion Yeah. on here. And MCY, you know, he's been with the band as long as me, but he didn't make one album in 2000. He's not on that. And on this album, his input is quite minimal, just on the vocals, but it wouldn't sound like, you know, it sounds like he's, he's right there. And I, I wanted his voice. I needed another voice because I, I got it down. I said, nah, nah, you better, you better get here and do these vocals. And nah, I've got them all sorted. He was, you know, just dealing with some other things in life. And I said, look, man, I've got, I got the good vocals sorted. They're written. And you know some of these songs anyway. You're on the originals. So let's do them. And got them in. And just, you know, being the engineer and the producer, the, everything of the album, yeah, it was just like, oh, no, well, this is right. This is a UHP album. And his vocals need to be in here. And it's that contrast, you know. Yeah. Back in 1990, when MCB Wear disappeared from the band, what happened is he went to a tangi in Gisborne, and this is when we were living in Auckland, and he just didn't reappear in Auckland. And I was like, hey, we got gigs. What's going on? He just didn't reappear. Yeah. And I've spoken with him since then because, you know, heck, that was 30 years ago. And he's like, well, you know, I just, you know, it was too much for him moving from Upper Hutt to Auckland. It wasn't around Fano and that. Yeah. And his whole family, you know, from Gisborne and that. So, so yeah. he just stayed there for a while. Yeah, he just stayed there. And then when he got back to Auckland, you know, he, you know, come and seen us. And it felt rather odd. I said, yeah, man, yeah, get on stage. And he got on stage and we did some songs. And it felt like, man, he's not, he's not with me anymore. It was me and him. People from that era were, you know, me and him are fronting about Posse mm. in 1990. And, you know, we, I know every lyric's coming. You know, we know each other's words and it's bang. But that was lost because when I said to Wire, when Bennett didn't come back, he says, oh, OK, you, you're stepping up then. Me and you, we're both up the front there, you know, and drag a muffin and I'm rapping. Yeah. And in a way, there's like, wow. That, that was fantastic and yeah. just uh, the voice of you know two brothers and there is something and I've heard people make comments of it you'd be well aware of it that when siblings sure. sing there's a little something going on there and I've noticed it yeah yeah, yeah. it's almost like it can almost be like one voice that's kind of split in, in two yeah and I think you guys have got that in a kind of rhythmic way you know R rhythmically you're your vocals are very uh, compatible, you know. So. I'll tell you what I want to do with the next album, which is we're playing our early Up Up Posse reggae songs that we were playing at, at the Clarendon Cricketers Arms in 1987, 88. This is even before it too. Yeah. 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 And we're going to be re-recording those songs. But it's like with the, we're going to be singing more, harmonising. Me... Blue Dread and MC Wire. We're right. going to be harmonising in a way that's not been heard before from us. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that because I see it as a challenge. Yeah. Blue Dread lives in Taranaki, you know. We need more practice and so probably won't get it. But, yeah. So that might be a bit more like one of those reggae vocal... Yes, groups, well, yeah. you know. We all love the gladiators. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It would be nice to hear something like that around here. Yeah. Uh, but we'll we'll keep our retain our our, our flavour there for sure. sure. Is that going to be the next record? Do you think? Oh, that is the next record. Excellent. I've programmed the songs up on a keyboard known as the Jupiter XM, 
which I doubt f- uh, very many people are actually using the sequencer on it. Mm. But it's a little keyboard, and I like the size of it. It's a new one. And, man, it's got Juno. It's got all the synth sounds you need. And I like it because it's got speakers on it. And I can play it, and I can... Yeah, I can be in bed working on the song. And yeah. it's not, I don't have it's to be a live plug- instrument. Yeah, <laughs> don't have to be plugged into things. Yeah. So I got about programming the songs off original recordings of the gigs that we did at one of them's from the Cricketers Arms, the other one's wow. from Clarendon. I says, right, I'm get these same tempos and that and bang. And yeah, I'm just giving you a whole... Uh, <laughs> this is a preview. Preview. Of the next record. Of the next <laughs> next record, which... Man. Yeah, well, I, I'd, I'd love to hear that, but we haven't uh, we haven't quite finished with this one yet. No, not at all. So we've we've got through all the songs, but you've done the seven dub mixes as well. And I was just wondering, how did you approach those? I mean, because they're not, you know, again, it's not like just taking the vocal away or slapping some some reverbs on, and you know, some of these have gone quite a long way from. The original track and the other thing is some of them are not tracks that you'd necessarily think of as being dub material you know mm-hmm. like there's one i think we're going to listen to which is preach preach dub yeah and yeah it, it, you know it's it's unusual to take a dub approach to a track like that i was just wondering yeah, yeah. what well what I, made you take it that way well overall my approach was after i'd finished the songs and when i was mixing the songs even i was like man i can't wait to do these dubs but what I do basically is like, right, this is it, okay, I'm going to pull this out, this out, this out, this out, and I'll, I'll probably just get down to the drums, like, all right, and then just the drums and bass. And I'll listen to just the drum and bass and think, oh, all right, now I'll leave the vocals right out. Or some of them, one of them I might have said, oh, no, I'll leave these vocals in and see what I'm going to take, do with the vocals. Yeah. But generally... <clears throat> Took the vocals out. But so you start, start by stripping it down, just to the strip it down just to the rhythm bass. section. Yep, that is basically what I'd done. Yeah, but then I'd look at some keyboard bits. I might want to uh, the guitar and just just feel like how am I going to keep this going as a song and make it dynamic. And so I'd bring in uh, uh, man. It was full on. It was just as much, or probably more mixing than mixing the song. Because I was cutting bits out here and there and this and that, and then right now I'm going to put delays on this and that, that and that, and that. Now nah, that's the wrong delay. Now, nah. well maybe it'll go on this bit and I'll go on this bit, and but I had it coming out of the computer into the desk and then into a delay, the RE20 uh, space echo delay, and so I was manually doing the delays, and I did say last week that sort of knocks out the other sounds. And so I had to go back into the computer. But I didn't have the delay going on every track, or else I might have had it going not so much. So I'd have the delay going on one, uh, let's say, so it's going into every channel. Yep. But I wouldn't have that knob turned up on, the, say, the guitar. Nah, well, I won't have it on the guitar, this particular. Verse. Or, yeah, and yeah. then I'd, I'd run it through and bounce out a, a version Yeah, with that. But it may have just been the instrument, not the whole song. And then, you know, I'd, I'd be d- 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 winding it up in places and and just getting the right tempo. And But then also, at the same time, so for some tracks before that, I had added dub effects in inside the computer and using sound toys. That's what I, that was the main one I was using. And... Yeah. So you didn't have to do those in real time. They were already programmed in. Well, yeah, when you got the tempo of the song there, yeah. they'll latch onto that tempo. But uh-huh. a lot of the time, too, also I was like, well, no, nah, I don't want them at that <laughs> that tempo. They've got to be off. Yeah. But on. Off but so, on. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so you can't, yeah. yeah. For those people out there, those budding dub you know, heads out there, yeah. you can't just, you know, go, this is the tempo of the, so it needs to be this tempo. Just wanted to, you know. You want to mess with it a bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mess with it. And, and how do you know? How long does a dub mix take you? How long did this one take? Preach, preach oh, dub. Preach. Oh, uh, days. You know. <laughs> days. Uh, and you know, I would get get it to a certain point, and I'd put the headphones on, I'd go for a run, and then walk along the beach, listening to it. Okay. Hmm. 
what needs to happen here. Yeah. And then, because I, I, I didn't figure myself going out of the computer through the desk and back into the computer. And then once I've got that in there, putting more effects and turning other instruments up and messing with the desk again, then going out of the computer again from the desk <laughs> into the computer to get the mix. Damn. It takes it time. Was circuitous. Is that the word? <laughs> circuitous, yeah, yeah. Round and round. But, but fun for anyone who's an engineer, sound engineer. Yeah. It would have just, it's just, it's a joy doing it because the actual process of making the dub is so you're listening to echoes mm. the whole day. <laughs> and, you know, people that love dub music love the echoes. So, you, you know, that's why you listen to dub music. But when you're actually making the thing, well, you're listening to echoes, just, yeah, man. On everything. <laughs> you're checking the echo on the snare, but not that next snare. Now, I pull snares out of the the, tr the track and put them on a different channel, which I've got the delay. Yeah. So the snare's not on, the, you know, the delay's not on every snare, but it's on the particular ones which I've placed there. Yeah. But at other times, I might have the, the delay on the snare track or the whole drum track, and I'm manually doing it with the RE the space echo and just turning it up and down in places. Yeah, it's some work. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's fun work, man. I can't think of a better job. <laughs> Love it. But oh, yeah, yeah. preach, dub. I, and, I, and I wasn't figuring on... I was just going to actually dub a few tracks. And then I thought, no, nah, it should be one side. So, yeah, 24 yeah. minutes, it's got to be one side. And I was like, man, I've just given myself a few more weeks' work with that. Yeah. But, you know, it's good work. Yeah. No, and it is really important to have a side of an album that you can put on at the beginning and leave it on, you know, and that you've got this this mood that continues. Yes, and definitely. And for a dub record, definitely. And doing Preach, uh, I felt it's not typically a dub a track that would be dubbed by anyone, like rock no. musicians, hard rock musicians. That's what aren't. I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> They're not thinking about doing dub versions. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, no, nah, this has got it. Because for me, it had the drums and then the bass and and the guitar, just in a way, it just felt like, yeah, this, this can lend itself to dub. I'm just sure it can. So I'm going to do it. Well, should we hear what happened <laughs> when yeah. you did it?
preach yes. dub. It's some. Uh, it's not like any other dub track I've ever heard. I have to say, it's had some wild stuff going on there. The guitars and the baritone sax, and uh, it's Earl Robertson's drumming on that yep. track. And yeah. Well, that's great. Oh, look, it's been great talking to you again and, and filling in these details. And the other thing I was going to mention, which we haven't had a chance to talk about at all, but I know you're going to be talking about it in the next hour, is the uh, the beautiful cover design. And you're going to be speaking to the designer, who's Ariki, is that yeah. right? Yeah, Taupuru Ariki. Fakataka Brightwell is her name, full name, yeah. Is this the first time you've worked with her on a design? Yes, I sort of met her from around the way she knows some djs that i know and one of them said oh that she's an artist and i went oh yeah i'll better check out what she does <laughs> yeah and i had a look online i said man hey she might be the one to do that the album cover and so yes i didn't say i was meant to at the start of the show to the listeners that i will be calling her uh, actually after this and just have a call at all about the artwork but essentially, I gave her uh, a sketch that says, okay, I want to deal with this UHP as though it's some kind of spaceship or just something like that, and showed her some other album covers. One of them is Sands of Time by SOS Band. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> which has a big SOS on yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And I love that album, <laughs> too. And I was saying, well, that type of thing, just another, another, world, another worldly thing, you know. And I didn't even have the the t title of the album when I told her, you know, to get into it. I was think, still thinking at that time of maybe it is preached to the converted. But, yeah, just more thought. And, yeah, I just throw, threw her that. I told her I'm from Ngāti Huia. This is my iwi. Hapu. And she pieced that in and put those birds in there. There's two huia in there. Uh -huh. And I was like, wow, to see it. And, yeah, oh, I'm blown away by it. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I'm yeah. keen to see that as a 12-inch. Yeah, know. yeah. That, that, <laughs> I've just seen it on the, you know, small scale. It's proper like that. Well, you know what I did when I got it from her? I blew it up so it was about ooh, A2 size. Yeah. And put it on the wall. She says, right, I don't know if that's it. But I'm, because I said to her, yeah, yeah, sweet, that'll, yeah, you've got it, yeah, that's it. But I wasn't sure in my head if it was. Because uh, she'd done it in Photoshop and there was a lot of, there's a whole ton of layers in there. And some things were overlapping other bits in there. Mm. And when I first seen it, I, you know, I've been using Photoshop for decades, so I, I knew what she'd done there and I was thinking, I'm not sure about that. And I said, no, nope. but then I said to her, that's all right. And then I said to her, said to her oh, I'm going to work, I'm going to work some work on it. <laughs> and I got into those layers and I removed things and moved this and then I changed the colors slightly of certain things and man, huh? that took weeks. So you were remixing it. <laughs> yeah, but no, if you see what she done and what I've done, no, mm -hmm. I've just, yeah, tweaked it and but I've changed the colors of some things and, but no, it's. I'm not, nah. She did the it's cover. A great it's not, it's it's a not great me. Design. I'm not <laughs> trying to claim anything. Oh, well, it'll be good to hear from her later in the program. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll let you go. Okay. What are we going to play? Well, what's my exit music? <laughs> counter dub. Yeah. The song we started with. Uh, let's get, let's oh, this is a up. great one. This has got the great uh, trombone and, and, and bass on it, too. Yeah, I love that trombone sound, you know. I first heard trombone played in reggae like that on Linton Creasy Johnson. Oh, records. yeah, yeah. Although trombone, of course, scutter lights, it's in songs and you know, other reggae songs. But for me, it wasn't really until, yeah, yeah as I said, LKJ. And I was like, yeah, man, that's groovy. Now, I just lo love actually hearing trombone, drums and bass. That's all that's needed. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's anyway, hear some. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Thanks for coming and brother. Peace. Thanks for having me.
Just still working at getting Topuru Ariki on the line. So I'm going to go into another dub version right now. Say do dub. And yeah, well, you know what? I'm having a little uh, trouble here getting the sister on the phone because I don't make many phone calls from here. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just keep playing these dub versions of the album, UHP Ho, until I get here. I'm going to try again right now.
Manga dub, and before that, soon dub from the new UHP album by the title of Ho. Now, people, people, I'm unable to get Topuru Ariki on the phone because I can't get this machines to work. It's kind of, yeah, there's the phone, and then there's this other thing, and you've got to push this button, then that button, and I had her, got her on the line, and then I'm pushing this button, that button, then no, uh, it's not happening. Uh, this is the, the, well, other radio stations, <laughs> they got some guy that's, or Wahine, who's actually, he deals with all the phones. It's not actually the announcer that has to deal with such things at, well, all those uh, fancy commercial radio stations. So uh, well, that's not even an excuse. I'm just letting you know that this is why this is occurring, is that I'm here once a week on Fridays for Takupu Na Takupu, and, yeah. This has played up on me before. I may try again. But what I'm going to do right now is play another dub track by the name of Ho, which is, well, man, I love this song, as you would have heard me speaking about it last week, uh, the week before last. And this is the dub version. And this, I must say, is just... A piece of work that I'm very, you know, happy with to have made this dub. Sounds like nothing else, which is, like, always important for me. Uh, here we go. Ho Dub. <laughs>
Ho Dub from the new UHP album. Now, still haven't managed to get the sister on line. Yes, well, as I'm unable to grip the sister on the phone just yet, I'm going to just play some instrumentals of the album. One side of the album is instrumental, the other side is dub, and there's four sides. And the other two sides make up the album, Hope, UHP. You can check it out online. I'm doing a, a special because it's just been released May the 1st. And so this is why I'm doing this for Takupu Na Takupu, well, you know, because, well, I produced this album, and here we go with, going to be playing side D, because it's for vinyl record of the instrumentals, and when I manage to get the artist of the fantastic cover artwork, we'll, we'll be discussing with her.
Kete fakarungo koe ki te kupu na te kupu. Yes, and this is te kupu. See if you can get a hold of the artist who did the artwork for the new UHP album titled Ho. That's H A U Ho. And let me just. I'm going to try right now with this. Have I got anyone there? Kia Oh, wow. I think that with the phone, it was actually okay <laughs> all those times when it sounded to me like it didn't work. But, <laughs> but yes, fantastic. I have you, sister, because, man. Right, I've just been speaking with Nick Bollinger, actually part two of you know, a two-part session, listening session for the album. And it occurred to me that I should talk with you about the artwork. But to start off, can you just introduce yourself, sister, to the listeners here? Hi, kia ora. Uh, thank you for having me, um, Dean. It's um, been a pleasure to come on. Um, my name is uh, Taupuru Aariki uh, Whakataka Brightwell. Uh, ngā iwi u rongo whakata, uh, raukau ngā titoa, and also ngā Ngāti Huia connection as well. And so I am a, um, an indigenous artist. My mahi revolves around telling our pūrākau of the land um, through uh, imagery, their murals, uh, is following the steps of our ancestors as well as the way we, we shared our knowledge and taught our knowledge orally and visually. And so I show that more in a contemporary context. And, and that, is, that is who I am. Um, I. Mm hmm. Uh, tēnā koe. Well, hey, let's start with that Ngāti Huia link. Because, as, as I said earlier with Nick, I says, when, when I mentioned to you that I'm Ngāti Huia, you grasped upon that in terms of putting together the artwork. Because what I gave you was not at all what I'm seeing here, <laughs> you know. What I'm seeing, well, the, the, the UHP lettering is yeah, kind of how I had it. And, but aside from that, everything you've added in, you know, it's just fantastic. So let's, uh, let's start by you, uh, well, maybe let, let's uh, focus this at international and uh, international audience. If they uh, if they can pull up online, go to Bandcamp, Upper Hut Posse slash Ho. That's the UHP album. Look at the artwork. They can see how busy it is. But let, I ask you some questions about it also. The the shape that's underlying it, that's behind, that's not only partly visible. The party. Yeah. yeah. If you could just explain some of what that means and why you decided to place it there and yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um so pātiki uh relates to the flounder so um for us so this is more my east coast side i've added into this um it represents abundance and providing for all and and, and all and all resources from 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 love to nurture to kai um, it is a symbol of provision and hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, I placed it in the centre there um, as the main kind of kaupapa, but also I used our shapes to show another shape. So um, it's like the gateway to the universe, the way it's placed behind uh, the character in the UHP letter. Mm -hmm. So I think like that. And, and then um, you, there's, above that, you just see those triangle, triangular patterns. And so... Um, I forgot to also mention, too, I have my Tahitian side, which is my mother's side. So I mm -hmm. also incorporate our link to Hawaii. And so Niho Tani is the word I've taught, but also Tahiti Niho Mo'o, which is the shark teeth, which represents strength um, and, and uh, warriorship. And so it encapsulates the Hawaii side and our Maori side, but also our link to Kai and to Manakitanga. Hi. Yes, and... Down below the UHP, Potama. Hi. How would Aye, you explain so Potama to, let's say, an eight-year-old in uh, Central America? Well, what, yes. does, what does Potama mean? You know. Yes, yes. So um, Potama 
is uh, in terms of Te Ao Māori, the world of Māori, uh, it's probably one of my most prominent um, patterns, mainly shown in the, in the artwork called Tuku Tuku, which is uh, the weave panel art in our meeting houses where we gather. And uh, this pattern is synonymous with the story of the 12 heavens. Um, so in, in the Māori context, there are many levels uh, to the heavens. Each has its own um, function within mm. the spiritual and the living and so this also represents a story we tell. Um, so depending who's coming from, there's two characters, uh, Tafaki or Tane Mahuta, and they ascend to heaven to claim the baskets of knowledge. And to Māori, um, that is where we uh, retrieve our ability to learn, but our ability to perform action, good and bad. So it was basically um, you know, the behaviour of mankind gifted to, 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 to the new life of this world. And it is what it is, so it's the uh, step. The protama is pretty much the step to the heavens, and so they're shaped like that, mm-hmm. leading up yeah. to the, the highest heaven of Eo Tiki Tiki Eo Matua Kore. Um, I would say in that context, to Western religion, you're related to the one, the one God, ultimate being. Uh, to us, Māori, his name is Eo. And mm-hmm. that is the pattern of protama. But in terms of a more modern context, as a whole, it represents um, success. So you're striving for success, striving mm-hmm. to be the best. That is that is the the main symbol of Potama, But digging deeper, that is the story that underlines with it. And just uh, in terms of when I approached you with the idea, and I was kind of all I gave you really was yeah the UHP letters, and then then just threw some artwork at you, namely one of them was the SOS band, stands a time cover, and then maybe some other ones. But then I said to you that, you know, yeah, futuristic space and, oh, just a whole, just things, but nature, because we also had, you also drew some some trees, aside from the ones that are in here, that were on the, the sides, the two, the left and bottom hand there. Those Rako uh, Rimu, which we ended up taking out and yeah just really how you were able to envisage the whole thing from what I'd <laughs> said to you which was kind of you know, like an open <laughs> book go for it but then yeah I think um, I think I think I I took in everything you shared with me, you know, because it was, it was the imagery, the inspiration. So like, like the 80s uh, album covers you showed me, like Earth, Wind and Fire, SOS, um, the theme, you know, of, of space and, and, and the epic, um, epicness of the universe. Mm-hmm. But also the other thing that encapsulated me was the colors you use in your new music, music video. Yeah. Um, and, and also, all the stories and all the co-papa you gave me, I thought to myself, because at first I thought to myself before I started, I was like, ooh, this is going to be an interesting one to tackle. But then, as I thought about it, after our court at all, I thought to myself, wait a minute, why don't I just throw everything in? And, and then we go from there. And that's how I felt. So I grabbed all those elements you, you described to me or, or showed me, and I just threw them into one image, and then from there, that's when we started to refine and deconstruct as well. And the rako at the bottom, too, um, are more symbolic of our rako and our forest and our great trees, like our kauri and our tōtara. Mm-hmm. However, they also represent their role as the children of Tāne, keeping Ranginui from falling to the earth. And so for those outside of the Māori realm, um, the trees to us, Stop the sky from joining back with the earth as they were separated by uh, the god of forest um, during the dawn of our world. And so without trees, the sky will fall and clash back, uh, uh, reunite with earth. And so that's another one too. Um, but yeah, it was just really that. It was just everything I just thought, yeah, bang, just chuck it all in, chuck it all in and bang, see what I come up with. Yeah, and I remember I was throwing at you like birds and yeah. and everything, and, and I see that the the py waka made it onto the potama there. Yes. And you noticed I've gone and changed some things here, but it was really just moving the layers 
back and forth. If yeah. you recall, wow, I'll, I'll show you that. And then I wanted to change the, the colour a, a little bit. So you, you do know I tweaked it a bit here and there, right? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. That, that, because, you know, it, we, it needs to, we need to, you know, share this and, and work with it together. You know, as, a, as an artist, um, I create and share the work and, and to that who is gifted too, you know, is now their gift to, to use and to manipulate. Well, in, I've, in my, in my I've got to say I was very pleased because I was a bit unsure of it because when I left <laughs> your studio with it, I said, yeah, that's it. I did have a little doubt in my head. I was thinking, oh, maybe I need to put those lines behind that layer. But I says, no, well, that's it from as far as we go here. Because it, you know, it could have dragged on forever. And because I've been using pro, uh, Photoshop <laughs> for decades, I felt like, oh, I can, I can get at those things. And if I asked you to get at them, this is going to take months. So, yeah. That's a, just that you know on here, that's why I did that. And but hey, that PY Waka there looking at it, that's that's what's in my backyard. There's a few of them there flying around. And yeah, beautiful to see. Yes, yes, we had one come into the studio last weekend and just sit we've got this um pipe standing on our workbench and they just sat there looking at all of us as we were having pipe last weekend. It was quite awesome. Okay, it didn't freak, freak anybody out because uh, I've heard Māori say, oh, that's a bad sign when a bird flies in the house. But, <laughs> oh, well, we, we have that vision as, you know, as a bad sign, but in my perspective, I always thought they were, they were messengers and, and, and brought luck to us. They only got a bad name because they were said to be blamed for the death of Māori. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, yeah. But in my mind, I always saw them as part of us and their messengers. Good and bad news, I always thought. Mm -hmm. And now, Hi. let's talk about what you put in the actual letters, the U, the H, and the P, starting with the H. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, that all started when you sent me a little sketch of kind of an idea of how a landscape and our culture could be shown within the lettering, I recall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I landed on that, and how we wanted to fit it in because you know it was so busy already. I wanted to make it like an engraving into the lettering that wasn't as um, overpowering. Mm -hmm. And so with the H, so the H that's probably the most important one. Um, that is called Mangoroa, Mangoroa, um, the great, the big, big shark. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for those outside. Mangoroa to us is the Milky Way galaxy. And the the shark on the H, you can see the spiral of it. It's our hoodie hoodie, the spiral of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you see that a lot on our waka, but also on the shoulders of our kāne as well. It's a very common pattern, quite, quite tapu to us, quite sacred. Um, but that is the figure in the middle, Mangoroa, mm -hmm. the Milky Way. Okay. Giant shark. Yeah, oh, it's fantastic to see. Yeah. Yes. And I should tell you that for the album, the physical album, the vinyl, I've put Mongoroa in the centre piece, the artwork, this, the record label. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Which, you, um, which will, yeah, you'll see when the vinyl arrives. Within a month now, I've been told. Oh, lovely. I am a... As you know, I'm a collector of records, so I was looking forward to that. <laughs> yes, yes. And so in the in the U, there's there's the waka which I had. Yeah, I remember sketching something like that also. Just as, yes. just as an idea, I was just sort of throwing things at you to see where you would take them. And yeah, again. Yes, yes. So um, the U and the P, starting with the U. Mm. Um, so. Both those letters represent our pipiha, or our um, where we come from. And so, starting with the waka, um, when we identify ourselves as, you know, through the Māori world, um, we we talk about the mountains we come from, the river we come from, our our ancestors. But one key element is our canoe. We we talk about our ancestral canoes that link to our tribe, and so this waka represents that. Um, the figurehead of the waka, though, uh, which we call it uh, Toihu, 
um, is more of the shape of a wakatoa walking uh, for war party, uh, mm-hmm. as we were warrior wreck. And so I wanted to celebrate that, um, but also our waka culture, because uh, waka su Māori is probably one of the key elements of our entire existence. Um, as, as waka brought us here, um, we look in waka at a waka in Um and so they are one of the most important elements to us. Yeah, mm-hmm. they were our main our main vehicles, you know, before the buses, before the horses, all that. Oh, they were everywhere. So they are part of us, and so we use them as part of our identity, and that's that's the youth. Yes, hey. Well, I recall how I was saying I want it to sort of be under construction and something like it's being designed and what. <laughs> I was blown away when I when I seen how you had the huia constructing the letters. I was like, "Wow, wicked!" I love yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're very dominant to me when I look at this. Those two huia birds there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for, for that, I was probably like, I think that was the first the first element, you know, or the second actually, yeah, because I, I worked on the lettering and then the, the second main element was the, the huia figure. And so the main inspiration for that design um, was uh, when you showed me the earth, wind and fire covers, I believe, and it had a very strong Egyptian theme. Mm-hmm. And then when you mentioned like space and, and, on, and things on the galactic level, I just, for some reason, I just thought of creating like a, a divine being, how the Egyptians would show their gods, I thought to myself, what, if, what, is, what would our Manu look like if we showed them in the form of an Egyptian god, the same physique? Yeah. And, and yeah. this, is, this is what I generated from it. And looking at it at the moment, for those of you who are interested in the artwork, so it's, um, there's actually two who are here. There's the male and female one. The male one's got the shorter bit, the female the longer one. And they are overlapping each other. And I overlap them to kind of make it look more of a divine being that represents, um, you know, this is represents all spectrums of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, but also, as you've, as you've shown it, um, as well in promotions, you can take them apart and show them as individuals. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. And as wings spread out, um, to me, it represents our whakapapa and our relationship to our manu and our iwi and the feathers of leadership, but also, and, and, that's, you know, and that's why I chose that money to relate to that. But I wanted to take the epicness up, like, like those album covers, and, and show it shooting a laser beam out of its eye, constructing UHP, like the Great Pyramids and the whole alien stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just yeah. totally out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, hey, man. Bigs up, big up. Hemihi nui ki a koe. Aye. And, uh, well, I'm going to let you go, sister. I'm just going to play some more uh, instrumentals from the album. And we'll be Bowie. catching up soon when I'll be bringing you the vinyl. Yeah, man, I can't wait for the vinyl. So, I look forward to that. Yeah. All right. Ka whawhai tonu mātou. Ake, ake, ake.
Deficit of Love. Yes. That's from the new UHP album titled Ho. Now, I'm going to finish the show by seeing if I can get in two more instrumentals. I played the vocal earlier with Nick Bollinger of this tune here, Patua Te Pa Whera. Instrumental, here it is. Instrumental on synthesizer sequencing bongos, mini congas, acoustic piano, TRO8 boom. That's me, Dean Harpeter on drums, Ricky Gooch on Guido, blocks, mini congas, 
Flexitone, Aaron Thompson, on tambourine, Rachel Keel Taylor, and on baritone saxophone, Jeff Henderson, on trumpet, Nigel Patterson, and on trombone, Chris Fox. Kaito Fagorongo Kwe Kita Kupu, La Kupu, been doing a part two of a on air listening session slash interview with Nick Bollinger and also I so spoke with Topuru Ariki who did the artwork for the album and we'll be going out of the radio show with Skin Na Kalawi Instrumental and I'm just going to mention who's playing the music on this so it's me on synthesizer, sequencing, electric bass semi-acoustic guitar, electric guitar alto saxophone, shaker an acoustic piano, TR08 Boom. Earl Robertson, Robertson is on drums. Jeff Henderson, baritone saxophone. Janet Holborough, cello. Aaron Thompson, kungas. Rachel Kill Taylor, tambourine. And Nigel Patterson, trumpet. Skin Na Kalawi, instrumental.